Welcome to this new video, today I will show you 6 terrible parasites that turn their prey into zombies. Indeed, yes, in nature, zombies, really exist. But don't be frightened, it's not about humans decaying and brain eating as we see in movies. Instead, it's about certain animals dealing with dreadful parasites. In this list, we will examine 6 of them, and as a bonus, I will reveal the only parasite known in the world capable of literally replacing an entire organ. Are you curious? Then let's get started. 6. Ophiocordyceps unilateralis A dreadful parasitic fungus widespread in all tropical forests, especially in Africa, Brazil, and Thailand. But don't worry, its favorite target is not humans but ants of the genus Camponotus leonardi. When the ants feed on the non-vital soft tissues of the fungus, some spores penetrate the insect's body through the respiratory spiracles. Once inside, the spore grows, extending its filaments throughout, colonizing its unfortunate victim. Meanwhile, it feeds on the ant's soft tissues, alters its behavior, and gradually takes more and more control, eventually reaching the brain. At this point, the ant becomes like a real zombie, entirely at the mercy of the parasitic fungus. In a terrifying climax, the ant is forced to climb 20-30 centimeters above the ground, for example, on a blade of grass, and there it is killed. The fungus will completely devour the insect, emerging its fruiting bodies directly from its head. Once matured, it will disperse its spores into the environment, continuing the reproductive cycle. Quite frightening, isn't it? 5. Forward Flies a species of flies that love to parasitize another species of ants, the fire ants. I mentioned these dangerous ants in a previous video about the most dangerous insects on the planet, link in the description. But how do they do it? The female, once fertilized by the male, launches herself onto her victims, directly injecting her eggs into their thorax. Here, the larva grows and develops, making its way inside the ant until it reaches the head. But why the head? Obviously, to devour its brain. The host remains alive for 2-3 weeks, retaining motor activity, but wanders aimlessly as it loses the ability to coordinate with other ants. And there you have another zombie ant. Upon the larva's development completion, it emerges from the ant's head, decapitating it. A finale worthy of the best horror film. 4. Plagiorhynchus cylindraceus. This parasite lives in the intestine of the starling, a bird similar to a sparrow, but it's not the bird that needs to worry. In fact, the favorite target of this parasite is a specific little crustacean, the armadillidiidae, or pill bug. But how does it reach its victim? Through a not-so-clean method, namely the starling's feces. Yes, it's quite disgusting. The eggs of this parasite are expelled along with the bird's droppings, the armadillo deity feeds on these feces, inadvertently consuming the parasite's eggs. Once inside, the eggs hatch within a few hours, and in 60 days, the larva becomes an adult. At this point, the parasite takes over the unfortunate insect, seizing control of its brain and forcing it to do absurd things. One of these is to make it come out into the open, compelling it to be eaten by its predators. And guess who is one of its predators? the starling itself. Absurd, right? And so the cycle continues indefinitely. 3. Leucochloridium paradoxum. This is a flatworm parasite that primarily inhabits wet areas such as forests in Europe and North America. Its life cycle is similar to the previous parasite. Indeed, this parasite reproduces inside the intestines of sparrows and finches, and its eggs are expelled through their feces. And who will be the designated victim this time? The poor snail of the genus Saxinia. It will undergo the terrible atrocities of this worm. Snails, while feeding on forest leaves, can come into contact with the parasite's eggs and ingest them. These eggs hatch inside the gastropod's digestive system and grow to reach the final larval stage. Once it takes over its victim's body, the worm migrates towards the snail's ocular tentacles, transforming them into actual luminous signals. And there you have a creepy zombie snail. Furthermore, the worm starts to pulsate, compelling the snail to remain exposed to sunlight. 
All of this inevitably attracts the attention of predator birds, such as finches and sparrows, of course. Another cycle of horror that continues. 2. Nematomorphs A group of parasitic worms, long and slender in shape, commonly known as horsehair worms, hair snakes, or gordian worms. Their diameter is just 2-3 millimeters, but they can grow up to 50 centimeters, with some species reportedly reaching up to 3 meters. Some of these worms grow inside grasshoppers, crickets, and praying mantises, feeding on their internal fluids. However, the adult stage of this parasite can only survive in the presence of water, and grasshoppers, crickets, and mantises are not aquatic insects. So how do they reach the water to survive? The deceitful parasite will force its victim to drown. Once it completes its development inside the host's body, this parasite will head for the brain. After doing so, it compels the hapless insect to plunge into the water, thus causing it to drown. At the same time, the parasite can emerge in its full length and continue its life cycle. A truly chilling spectacle, I must say. Moreover, most of the time, this occurs at the level of the victim's anal opening, leaving the insect in agony but still conscious, making it all the more macabre. But how do they infect other grasshoppers, crickets, and mantises? By hiding their eggs inside fly larvae found in water. The infected fly, once mature, is unaware of harboring a parasite inside, and when it is eaten, well, you know how it ends. 1. Dinocampus cochinelli this, charming, parasitic wasp injects its eggs into ladybugs and turns them into, zombies, to protect its own larva. Yes, even the poor ladybug falls victim to ruthless parasites. Once the prey is identified, this wasp attacks and implants an egg into the ladybug's abdomen with its stinger. After about a week, a larva emerges from the egg. The parasite eliminates any other eggs and begins to grow inside the body devouring the soft tissues and gonads of the unfortunate ladybug. Despite this, the victim continues to go about its life, feeding regularly. How is this possible? Because the larva takes care to avoid damaging the ladybug's vital organs. But why should it care about the life of its victim? I'll get to that soon. Meanwhile, the parasite grows, and when it reaches the final larval stage, it is ready to emerge. At this point, it paralyzes the ladybug by severing the nerve connections of its legs and with the help of a virus, then exits the abdomen. The larva then wraps itself in its cocoon, just beneath the immobilized ladybug. At this point, this cocoon would be a succulent meal for predators, as it would be completely defenseless. It is precisely at this moment that the parasite exploits the ladybug, using it as a sort of shield and bodyguard. That's why it needed it to be alive. The ladybug's bright colors deter predators as they signal danger, indicating, not good to eat, or dangerous. Additionally, it secretes toxic and unpleasant fluids, providing an additional deterrent. After about 10 days, the Dinocampus cochinelli wasp emerges from the cocoon and leaves the ladybug to its fate. The peculiar thing is that often ladybugs survive this nightmare and fully recover. Although, if I were them, I would be a bit traumatized. Bonus, Simothoa exigua. It is known as the tongue-eating louse, but it's actually a small isopod crustacean belonging to the family Simothoidae, which doesn't exceed 3-4 centimeters in size. Its distribution is wide, ranging from the Gulf of California, to the Gulf of Guayaquil, Ecuador, the Mediterranean, and some areas of the Atlantic. Being an aquatic crustacean, its preferred targets this time are not insects but fishes, such as saddled breams or snappers. Since it's called the tongue-eating louse, what could it possibly do to its poor victim? Exactly. It eats its tongue. And how does it do it? Let me explain. When it's still tiny, it enters the fish through the gills, develops, can then change sex from male to female, and finally makes its way into the fish's oral cavity. It's the females, being larger, that attach better to the tongue and begin to suck its blood, causing it to atrophy and fall off. The next step is straightforward. The crustacean replaces the fish's tongue, attaching itself with its hooked little feet to the muscles at the base of the tongue. However, 
The feeding habits of our charming crustacean change from bloodsucking to feeding on part of the fish's food or even the host's mucus. Now one might ask, can it get any worse than this? And the answer can only be, of course. I remind you that our new tongue has yet to reproduce. And what could be a better love nest than a fish's mouth? The male, meanwhile, remains in the gills, and it reaches the female to reproduce. The female then releases her eggs directly from the fish's mouth into the sea, and after doing so, she usually detaches from her victim and dies. Finally, the poor fish is free from the parasite. Unfortunately, there's no reason to be too happy about it. Left without a tongue, it can no longer feed, so it will die of hunger. A tragic end for the poor fish. In the meantime, other small, tongue-eating lice may begin to seek the next victim. And so concludes this horror-themed ranking, which makes us aware that nature can sometimes be truly ruthless and terrifying. I hope I haven't scared you too much, and if I've piqued your curiosity, leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you won't miss the next content. See you soon, in the next video. To feed your brain again, not to eat it, don't worry.